Do not adjust your podcast. It is Human Factors Cast, episode 64, and it's October 30th, 2017. You're listening to our Halloween special. Today, we're talking about how drones are no longer scary to the air traffic controllers. And we're looking at Amazon and their home invasion. And also, scary, scary LA and the ride sharing. Human Factors Cast starts right now. <laughs> Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Well, that was really bad. I don't know why I did that. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. Joined today for an extra spooky episode of Human Factors Cast is my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, yes. Thank you for that spooky intro, Nick. That just made my day. Oh, I know. I Yeah, it took me a while to do, but we're good. We're good. Blake, how are you, buddy? Oh, man, I am doing pretty good on this wonderful Monday evening. How have you been, Nick? I know today's been a bit of a strange day. Today is a strange day. So, (laughs) as frequent listeners of the podcast know, I commute 120 miles a day. And if, if anything were to go wrong, I would expect it to go wrong in that period of time where I am driving from my place of residence to my place of work and not necessarily anything that happens from my place of residence to my car or from my car to work because that distance is so short well today i uh as i was walking home i almost made it home without any accidents and uh a dog bit me on my leg so if i make any grunting noises or or, uh sort of unsavory sounds during this extra special spooky episode of human factors cast i guess it's appropriate but also that's what's going on so uh if i'm if i'm grunting it's because uh of a dog bite so so that's may or may not turn into a werewolf in the middle of the of the podcast thank Uh, goodness we record this remotely so i don't have to deal with a werewolf this evening (laughs) (laughs) yes oh man yeah so so that sounds like a little bit of a a crazy day, Dick. I won't lie, but I guess it's appropriate for the almost Halloween esque nature of our show tonight. I guess so. I'm trying to be good natured about it. I'm not, you know, it's people people who have pets and and pets do crazy things sometimes. So I'm I'm trying to look on the bright side of things and all that. But anyway, so I just want to again shout out to our Human Factors Cast community Slack because uh, we we are going to well first off shout out to Axel and Micah for joining us uh since the last time we had a podcast um it's growing please come check us out where our link is on our SoundCloud uh in the show description uh, pretty much anywhere you can find us as well as our website so go check us out uh, hang out with us we are starting a weekly discussion so we're going to start to do this question every week where we kind of ask you guys uh, questions about your experience in the field, and anyone can answer these, you know, whether or not you're an undergrad studying human factors or a practitioner that's been doing this for 30 years. It's a wide range of, uh, of we, we want a wide range of experience and, and to just kind of sample the, uh, the practitioner pool, if you will, to get a variety of answers. And so, like, for example, this week, which we have no hits on yet because, you know, well, we'll get there. We'll get there. The slack is still growing, but we asked, you know, what's, uh, what's your biggest challenge in your job and how are you overcoming it? So, you know, it's, it's those types of questions. Um, but, but look forward to those. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to make it a segment on the show if we get enough responses to where, uh, you know, we'll share other people's stories and, and it's always kind of nice to know, um, you know, who else is having the same problems as you, or, or same challenges or, you know, just to kind of get that other point of view. And and uh, who knows? Maybe you guys can connect over Slack and work stuff out and, and make a connection there. So look forward to that. But, Blake, I have to know what's going on with you, buddy. Oh, man. Okay. So I'm sure, like a lot of people over the weekend, they enjoyed, or maybe last week, I didn't do it till the weekend, they enjoyed some of the new Stranger Things. But I actually wanted to tie the 
introduction of Stranger Things and my comment about Blade Runner from last week together and talk a little bit about how awesome sound design is in both movies and now we're seeing in television. I mean, because it's both in both of these different, like two very different storylines. The use of music is very immersive in the time frame, but also it kind of like drives along the story as you go. I know in Blade Runner, a lot of the scenes were not very dialogue heavy. They were driven more by the sounds that were happening in that specific scene to kind of like instill a specific emotion in you, whether it was like a stressful emotion or a sad feeling or a, like a, uh, a feeling of nostalgia. And so I just wanted to shout out both of those because like in the instance of Blade Runner, a lot of the story is driven by sound. And in, then in the instance of like Stranger Things, of course, we know it's supposed to be set in the 80s. And a lot, I think, of what helps with that setting besides, of course, some of the visual aspects is a lot of the music choice, be it like from the 80s themselves, but even the original score as well. So that's really what I had for my banter this week. Man, that synth, though. Oh, my goodness. It's so good. Oh, I have it going. Uh, can you hear it on your end? I cannot. I can hear. I, no, I hear it a little bit in the background. Oh, it's so good. All right. Anyway. So, okay. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree, man. I, I was enjoying Stranger Things this weekend as well. Don't worry. Spoiler spoiler free podcast. We're not going to talk about any of that. Just Just the fact that it brings that sort of nostalgia and is sort of a, a setting, right? It kind of sets the stage. And then, um, yeah, I have something very similar. Like uh, when um, when JJ was directing episode seven, he kind of gave a comment where you know he has John Williams, and that's almost like cheating because the way he brings music to tell a story, to bring the audience along on this thing, it's it's like it is cheating because uh, it's it's John freaking Williams. I mean, <laughs> what else you want, right? Yeah, he's the man, especially when it comes to using just different scores to really drive where the story is going and inflict emotions. It's uh, it's amazing what music can do, especially now when we think about how advanced like visual effects have gotten. But I don't know without, without like the sound behind a lot of stories, it just wouldn't be as good. There are some really great uh, YouTube videos. Just by the way, if anyone's curious, there's some really great YouTube videos of um, like star Wars without John Williams or, uh, or, or just any show or any movie without the iconic soundtrack, and uh, they're they're pretty great <laughs> if you have some time to kill. Um, okay, Blake, are you are you ready to get into the news? Oh, let's do it, my man. All right, this is the part of the show all about human factors news. This is where we talk about what do you what do you think sports? So who's playing who and what's going on next week in the world of football, Blake? Well, you know, the Falcons are playing this weekend. No, not at all. All right. So we're talking a little bit about air traffic control and drones real quick. So air traffic controllers have had it bad enough managing full-size aircraft, but they face an even extra headache when you throw drones into the mix. So you see controllers get calls when drone pilots want approval to fly within five miles of an airport. And with an average of about 250 reported close encounters per month, it's clear that some aren't even bothering with these formalities. So the FAA has clear, clearly had enough for, of this as it's made, recently made an emergency request to bypass the usual regulations and use an, use an automated system to help with approving drone flights in restricted airspace. So instead of waiting about two to, instead of waiting two, three months for clearance or calling in at the last possible moment, you can go ahead and get an AOK within five minutes. Now, Nick, I've done a lot of work in my past my graduate career of trying to figure out how to integrate new tools for air traffic controllers to deal with just more aircraft in their sectors, much less talking about drones. And I know drones add such a different mechanic because of the speed at which they can travel, the new classes of airspace. So I can only imagine these kind of regulations are really going to lower workload of air traffic controllers. Yeah, I would certainly hope so. I mean, this is an example of automation integrating with uh, a job or, or a human operator task, in this case, of the air traffic controllers, where it will enhance their job, right? They're doing this stuff anyway, but to be able to speed it up to within five minutes, that, that the turnaround time of that has increased dramatically from two to three months, right? Yeah, which is such a dramatic increase done by automation. The only the only thing I really, I guess, I start questioning here, and I know this is kind of related more to if you're trying to get within five miles of an airport. So 
there's a, there's a couple of things when it comes to drones. I mean, they fly in a different class of airspace. Mostly, if we're talking about like military aircraft, we get a little bit in a different space of uh, how this topic works. But the only thing I would be concerned with is, I guess, now we're letting automation clear something so quickly. What if there is an incident? How do you how do you make sure that the ATC is able to jump back into the loop? Because this this is a problem that exists with actual aircraft now because there are automated tools that help air traffic controllers manage their sector without having to worry about each and every aircraft uh, so i would be just be concerned about how this kind of impacts that if a drone's within x amount of miles of your airport and you have kind of like a a problem that happens all at once maybe the automation can't actually handle what to do with the drone correctly or if you have to make like a, a last minute maneuver for a full size aircraft, how that really impacts the uh, the ability of an ATC to recover from that. That would be my main concern. Yeah, so I'm looking at uh, some of the forms required for these drone pilots who... So it's, uh, th- it's important to note that these drone pilots are not just, you know, willy-nilly, I, I want to fly near an airport. This is for, like, emergency emergencies, right, where potentially medical supplies or... Um, uh, things of that nature are going to be around uh, or, or need to fly through airspace that is uh, situated around an airport or a high traffic area. Um, you know, just to, just to give our listeners some context here. So I'm looking at this form and uh, I don't think it looks any different from the submitter's uh, side, right? And the fact that this is being used for emergency circumstances, it would make sense that instead of, um, you know, having a having a two to three month turnaround time, you have something very quick, especially when lives could depend on it. So I I think this is a step in the right direction for everybody. Oh yeah, I think you're right too. Because it also it mentions in the article like just a the backlog of items it had pending for approval was like somewhere in the 6,000 range. And so this was expected to grow about, I don't know, five times over the next six months. So being able to quickly clear all of these like drone needs makes a lot of sense. Cause I, I don't know if you're trying to do this as an ATC, I, I would almost feel like you would want to start just designating one ATC for dealing with drones at that point, which is adding like a, a complete new position that could, could affect some Tracons or some ATC centers differently than it would others. So I think this is the, this is the right call, especially since like you mentioned, a lot of this is for emergency requests kind of at the last moment. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. You have any other thoughts on this one before we move on to home invasion? Oh, let's go to home invasion. <laughs> okay. This, one, this one's spicy for me. Okay. I cannot wait to hear your thoughts on this one. <laughs> Okay, so Amazon is definitely well known for making delivery services as convenient as possible. I mean, we're talking free delivery that can be lightning fast and even sometime in the future, maybe drone delivery. But now it's eliminating the need for you to even be at home when you want to receive packages at your house because its couriers can now simply let themselves into your property. Yes, you heard me right. So this is a Prime members only service called the Amazon Key, and it uses a smart lock and connected camera that allows couriers to request access to your house and will be recorded while they do so. Okay, Nick, this scares me to no end. And I totally get that there's a camera involved and there's some authentication services going on, it sounds like, from the Amazon article. But I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this because you are much more into the connecting and Internet of Things of the home than I am. So what do you think about this? Sure, sure. So, I mean, okay, look, there's uh, let me play this little sound clip just to give our our listeners a little bit better understanding here. So Amazon Key, a new service that enables in-home delivery. Uh, so, so you get... With the Amazon Key app, you can also grant access to the people you trust. Let- so, okay. So there's a couple things going on. So basically you, you purchase this, uh, um, this door lock that you can grant people access to it. And uh, you can also grant your couriers access to it. So the the idea is um, they send a request to the Amazon service and the Amazon service unlocks your door. It starts a camera feed right away and starts recording what's going on uh, at your front door. 
they drop it off and they're out the door and everything presumably goes smoothly. My thoughts on this. <laughs> so, so you're interested in my thoughts, Blake? Well, my thoughts are this. Uh, this is more than just a service for Prime members to, um, to, to get into the, to, or to have their packages dropped off inside. Sorry, excuse me. Um, this is basically another way for people to buy into the whole Amazon ecosystem. Right. If you now have a way to lock your doors with Alexa or you have a way to control a camera with Alexa, these are all new ways to buy into this ecosystem while subverting um, expectations for um, shoppers. Right. So so they're kind of coming in under the radar and saying, look, we have this service. Oh, hey, also, look, that was two Internet of Things devices that you ha now have that integrate with Alexa. So. Here you go. You're in now. I mean, you're you're already invested, and uh, it's kind of like that setup where uh, you set it and forget it. As long as the camera's looking at the door, uh, there's that. Now we've been alluding to this whole home invasion thing. Um, again, the idea is that everything would be recorded, and in theory, you know, things would be safe. You would. Uh, you would know who's coming in your house and dropping your package off, and that's it, really. Um, but I don't know, man. I think, for me, this kind of crosses the line, right? And why should it, though? Because I'm already letting Amazon into my house with Alexa, but now I'm letting other people that are not Amazon. But you would you could argue that Amazon is even more of a entity that I don't want in my house than just a random post person that's just going to drop it off at the front door. Like, I don't know, man. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. I haven't fully processed this and I don't know if I will buy in yet. I just don't. <laughs> All right. So let me toss a few ideas back and forth then. Cause sure. Honestly, I came in hard saying, Oh, I'm scared of this. And there, there are some scary aspects to it, but let's, let's think about some of the positives here. I mean, it depends on where you live and it depends on like how many packages you get to your house at a time. But I know that my dad is always ordering stuff from Amazon. So is his wife. And so is uh, her daughter. And so they're getting packages all the time and you don't really want them sitting out, out there all by themselves, either if you're worried about people taking them or if you live in New Jersey and it gets really cold and snows and you can potentially ruin some of your packages, it would be pretty awesome for somebody to be able to come to your door in a secured manner, uh, access your access your house, but only have the privileges to do so while being watched. And then once the transaction's over, you actually get the video of what's happened. You get the confirmation that your door has been locked again. And I'm assuming that this is going to also have to require some kind of extra, you know, security ish customer service from Amazon, because what if things go wrong? What if the person forgets to lock the door? Can you lock it from your app? How do you make sure that everything's uh, PC and good to go? Uh, so there's a lot of good points to this. And Nick, I think you are absolutely right. Amazon's really pushing for this, um, and it's it's awesome to see because it's really, I think, getting towards that smart home, Internet of Things integrated in your household to potentially make your life just simpler. Um, where we get into the weird territory is definitely like the implications of what happens when this gets hacked or if it gets hacked. Uh, if, if this is a, a thing yeah. that's being used, maybe while you're out of town and somebody's able to hack the camera and make it look like that the, the door has been locked and all that, but they're actually in your house ransacking your house. I mean, that's that's probably like some some level 10 paranoid stuff to be thinking about. But I mean, with introductions of the Internet of Things technologies like this, especially when they're kind of disparate pieces, not like all built into the house from the ground up, you do put yourself at some kind of risk and vulnerability. But same time this definitely makes life easier for at first prime members but anybody that i think is buying into the ecosystem for amazon well let me ask you this blake do you have do you have pets uh preferably dogs that don't bite you <laughs> uh no not here but i've had them in the past so my concern is more along the lines of when you leave the house in the morning uh you double triple check especially if you have pets or children um or you know teenagers or whatever you you double triple check before you leave that the door is locked uh and i i think that the post people have a different agenda right this is not to say that i blame them it's part of the system 
where they are just trying to get from point A to point B to point C as quickly as and efficiently as possible. And if you just so happen to be the one house that they forget to um, close the door all the way and lock the door, like, and your love, your loved fur babies get out. That's it. That's, I don't know if it's worth it to me for that alone. Oh yeah. I a hundred percent agree with you there. It's, it's one of those things where I feel like there's gotta be some serious fail safes built into this lock or that it's like that it's built into the the process, the steps these Amazon carrier couriers have to go through. Like you have to, I don't know, because it, it, it alludes to the fact that you're basically having to say, OK, I'm here to deliver a package and that's how you get to open the door or request to open the door turns on the camera. And then maybe the fall, the last step being that you confirm that you have locked the, uh, you know, lock the smart lock from your your courier app or something like that, just to make sure those things don't happen. If, sure, sure. If not, like, actually including, I don't know, ways to shut the door and make sure it's locked from the user side if they notice that, oh, the door is not actually locked. Well, see, you can lock a door, but it doesn't necessarily have to be closed, too. So that's another thing, right? They could, they could theoretically close the door almost all the way and lock it and then open it back up and you're in. Yeah. I mean, the problem with that, though, is, and again, this is me trying to play both sides and not sure how I'm doing here, but depending on where the camera is and how it's placed or if it's multiple cameras, I feel like you could easily catch that. Um, But then the problem is like, okay, I know it's a problem, but what do I do if I'm like, you know, if I have an hour commute? Or if you're overseas or something? Like like you were talking, your your fur babies are going to get out by accident. Or something more illicit illicit is going to happen. So there are there are definitely challenges with this. So I will say I may I may opt into the service, uh, but I don't think that I will use it for the Amazon service. I don't think I'll use it for the um, letting in my couriers. I think I'll use it more as a hey, we're out of town and we want to let a friend in to check on our cats or something. You know, like that is more of a of a use case that I can think of for me. And I also get a cloud cam and a smart lock that, you know, to boot. So I, I think that's where I'm at with it. Um, I feel like there is a lot to go wrong with it and I'm just not ready to let that risk into my life. Uh, and we'll, we'll see. I'm sure there's going to be horror stories in the next couple months of, you know, instances where this did not go that well. And I'm sure we'll keep our listeners posted on those. But I mean, I, yeah, I, I thought it was interesting and, and mostly for that human element behind it, right? The, the couriers, they have a different agenda than we do. And, um, I'm not saying that they are dishonest people or anything like that. Uh, I think they're just trying to get on to the next place as quickly and as efficiently as they can. And that's their tasking. And, you know, it's just somewhere along the line, uh, because of the tasking that they are faced with, it's they're going to mess up and someone's life is going to be ruined, um, presumably because of this. That's I, I maybe that might be hyperbole. I don't know. Um, but I, I, the, this just to me uh, <laughs> screams so much that there's, it's, it's going to be accident prone. Um, and I do have to say that there was an onion article this week. Did you see this Blake? No, I didn't. <laughs> There's an Onion article uh, about how Amazon's uh, Amazon's newest service will have somebody show up to your door and kill you for you. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's oh, the geez. headline reads: "Popular new Amazon service just comes to your house and kills you." Uh, <laughs> See, that's that's scary enough because yeah, I don't know. You, if you put too many ideas out there, bad things happen sometimes. Yeah, oh, let me God. see. It. Um, but you know, Nick, I really like the the positive spin that you put on it of maybe using it for something like you being out of town and you've got pets or you want like a friend to house it. And now you don't have to worry about like getting them an extra key or yeah. any of that. I mean, it's all like app based, so that's a really cool use case of it. And if I think if Amazon does like on launch see a lot of problems with this, that might be another way to really spin it. Well, like just as kind of like a, a friends and family type of thing. Um, I don't know if that would be as, you know, revenue making as their intent for having, <laughs> having packages put in your house, but it's still another, right. another push for the internet things in your home. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. I'm yeah, not totally bought in yet, but we will see where it goes. 
Uh, all right. So before we move on, I just want to thank all of our friends at uh, Wired and Gadget. And that's it for all of our stories this week. <laughs> If you uh, and the next web, I think, right? We have the next yep, web and the here? next web and the next web. Uh, if you guys have any suggestions for stories, uh, hit us up on social media. Or if you want to follow along with us as we find those stories, we post those out on social media as we find them, as well as our Slack. Our Slack uh, subscribers actually get those uh, a little bit before everybody else does on the social medias because uh, we we send them there first and then we send them out uh, just to just to kind of get some feedback on them. So. Uh, do join up on our Slack, and, and you may get a couple more articles than are not on the social medias. All right. So, Blake, what do we got up next? All right. This was kind of an interesting topic. So the Los Angeles Co- County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, that's an awesome name, announced last week that it's looking for a friend to help build help it build an on-demand transit program, which would supplement the services the agency already r- already runs. So Metro keeps its demands vague in the interest of sparking creative solutions to this problem, but it does have a it has given a sense of the sort of experimental service it would like to roll out in 2018. So kind of like Lyft or Uber, you'd be using a smartphone app to call a ride uh, from either a small van or a, or a sedan like which you would share with other riders. So you'd pay a subsidized fixed rate fee that's competitive with today's ride sharing services, of course, and you'd be able to take these vehicles wherever you wanted within the driver's service area. So I thought it was pretty funny that this article came up, Nick, because last week I mentioned that I was going to be going to a conference called Design Forward, and there was a lot of speakers that were actually looking at this issue, more so from the aspect of we're in urban populated areas traffic is insane and there's nowhere like LA that can tell you this is true and by implementing something like this where it's run by the actual city and it's more automatized vehicles or at first it sounds like having kind of ride share drivers to help you get around this was definitely a a hot topic about how do you design this infrastructure that can handle you know getting everybody where they need to be does this have to do with like do you you got to go into work at different times to cut down traffic. Just all of the kind of human factors and design issues that come with implementing a system like this. Yeah, so I pulled this for that exact reason, Blake, because I knew you were at that conference and I knew they were talking about this stuff. Uh, just kidding. I, I'm not that clairvoyant. But <laughs> I will say, no, this is very interesting, especially from a human factors perspective, right? So uh, the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority uh, they actually, I'm, now I'm just doing it to show off. They actually, uh, <laughs> they know that there is some sort of magic behind these uh, crowd sh- crowdsourced services like Lyft and Uber, right? And they know that this is a potential solution. Uh, now, I do have to say, this is sort of, there, there's an interesting challenge with this because one thing that I kept thinking about as I was reading this article is, well, who's using public transportation? It may not necessarily be people who have access to smart devices. And so how do you put or how, or how do you account for those individuals that may be um, in a lower socioeconomic bracket that do not have access to these things, right? So do you potentially put a station where they can, um, you know, uh, hit a button and uh, a vehicle shows up? And how do you val- how do you do the validation at that point? Is it like a, is it a system where it takes your picture and you have to put in your name so that way the person who's coming to pick you up can see that? There's a lot of different, challenges with this and they're operating off of the assumption that uh you have a smartphone or a smart device and like i said a lot of times people who are taking public transportation don't have access to these services so it is a challenge that you have to work around and i like that they're leaving it open-ended for people to sort of think about these and um be interested to see what they come up with yeah and i totally agree nick i mean honestly this is a great idea of trying to really figure out how to reduce traffic, make things run a little smoother. But I'm of the same opinion of you as you are. I mean, well, damn this it, Blake, to me you have to disagree. Take an entire like system architecture to really make work correctly. Damn it, Blake, you have to disagree, man. 
we we have to go we have to butt heads on these things so that way we provide interesting commentary for our listeners <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think that what you're talking about is necessarily the biggest deal. I mean, figuring out how, because there's plenty of people. I mean, there was at least three or four talks on how to make smart cities, what you can do about worrying about the low so- socioeconomic population if they don't have a sure. smartphone. I think that this is more about a paradigm shift in how people travel and stopping people from actually using their daily drivers to even go to work and changing how the work schedules actually pan out so that more people can get places and traffic is actually reduced versus and then on top of that what you were talking about with people not having smartphones i think that is somewhat of an issue but i think the bigger issue is is trying to now change the population of people who are in addition to those who already use transit like this now this is your more, your working class, the people that go to the high-paying corporate jobs, trying to get them to buy into doing this, that it actually has benefits to them as far as like time traveled, um, you know, costs for insurance, stuff like that. So I I agree that this is a good idea, but I think that a different approach is required than just create getting an app service to work because I think that's just I think that's uh, I think that's just replicating what we already have, but making it for Los Angeles uh, public transit, and that's not really going to solve the problem. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree with that. I think, um, yeah, you bring up a, excuse me, you bring up a good point about how how you're going to bring in other people into this, uh, people who already, you know, see the benefit of or, or don't don't see the benefit of public transportation. And I I think we're halfway there with a paradigm shift. I know a lot of people that use Lyft and Uber, and I know a lot more that would use it if it were less expensive, especially um, because it goes from point A to point B with maybe a couple stops on the way rather than uh, a lot of stops. So, um, yeah, it's interesting for sure. I, I'm i really curious to see. So I pulled this because obviously it's a unique design challenge, and uh, they are putting a call forth to sort of design these unique solutions to this problem. And uh, who knows, maybe one of our listeners will will come forward and, and uh, come up with the right solution. I don't know. But it, it is one of those things where I'm just like, okay, this is an interesting perspective on how to take the whole public public transportation and run it through a paradigm uh, shift and, and come up with something new. And I almost, I almost feel like this is too structured where... If somebody, it's like a writing prompt where, um, you know, they, they kind of give you the punchline rather than the beginning. You, you know what I'm saying by that? Like, they, they want you to do it. The ending of the story is, and then they all were using public transportation in the sense of ride sharing. Rather than, let's revolutionize the way we do public transportation. Yeah. And that, that's a pretty inter or it's a really good point to make because that, that worries me a little bit too, that because we're, we're, we're at the end of 2017, right? <laughs> pretty much. I mean, there's a couple yeah. more months left and they're talking about rolling out an experimental service. That's basically like services that exist now. And I think that's, I think that's maybe where my brain's trying to go. That doing what we already are doing right now, but just changing who's giving the ride sharing service doesn't really solve the problem they're trying to tackle. And it makes me worry that the stakeholders behind this are going to push too hard for this particular solution. I think if they really want to see a change on this kind of scale, it can't just be about having a smartphone app that lets you do this. It gets more into what you're talking about, having smart cities. So if, if somebody doesn't have a smartphone, they can still get access to this. I mean, it, like they said, it's coming out of like a subsidy that you're paying to be able to use this service. So somehow being able to track those people, making sure that uh, the right people are getting in the right cars at the right time. But also, like, let's think a little wider. I mean, we, you and I have gone through for at least the past month with maybe one or two stories about the legislation behind self-driving cars and automated cars. I mean, I feel like this is the ultimate place to test it in a like in a public transit type of session type of setting to get the ball rolling for that kind that kind of research to be implemented into you know a city's infrastructure i think la is a great one because traffic is so bad and it's going to take so many changes to be able to like mitigate it that it's a good place to start yeah yeah 
uh, I'm interested in the metrics of the before and after. I want to know what what sorts of things they are measuring, um, like uh, my average miles per hour on a on a frequently um, traveled public transportation route. Like I don't know. Uh, time to destination, satisfaction ratings. It'd be interesting to see what they use. But, uh, yeah, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? Uh, not really. The only thing is that I hope to, who, what, whatever company comes at it, I hope it's like an amalgamation of companies, not just like an Uber or a Lyft, yeah. but a couple of people coming together to really come up with an innovative solution. I do, too. Okay, you ready to get into this last story of the week? Oh, let's get into it. This one, This one's pretty pretty heavy it feels like all right so the uk's competition and markets authority is investigating business practices in the hotel hotel comparison website industry to see (laughs) to see if consumers are being taken advantage of with high pressure sales tactics and deceptive deals the investigation follows a year-long study of hotel booking of the hotel booking market and really examines are discount deals and search results actually accurate for what they're showing people are these high pressure tactics that pe- the companies are using actually misleading customers and the demand or availability of hotel rooms in order to can worse a quick sale? And lastly, are sites upfront with any additional fees showing them as early and clearly as possible in the pricing tiers? So this, this article, I think has a lot of implications because I, I don't know about you, Nick, but I've seen a lot of like dark UX and dark patterns about you building a user experience coming out in like different news outlets. So this one kind of has a little bit of that theme going on in it. Uh, and I, this is something I think I've experienced before, like uh, with, I won't, I won't say the name of any of the places, but definitely felt like I was being super pressured to make a decision as quick as possible and definitely not getting the best deal because of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, <laughs> so this one to me, Reminds me a lot. Did you hear about this law in China that they passed? That uh, re- no, and I like I couldn't even believe it when I read this in the show notes. You've got to tell the people about this. This is nuts to me. Yeah, so there is a law that was passed in China that uh, requires video game makers um, of not just mobile games but but major AAA titles that have loot boxes. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about loot boxes recently with uh it was actually funny enough right after the battlefront 2 beta and uh a game called shadow of war mordor shadow of war uh, i don't know yeah 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 uh the, so so basically the idea here is that these loot boxes contain in-game items and you have some randomized chance to get any specific item now uh china passed this law that says that game developers must disclose the odds of getting um certain rarity of items in the game if they're paid for by real world money. Now this is because the loot box system emulates what it's like to gamble, right? You pull the button or you, or you pull the pull the lever and you get some random um assortment of loot which has different varying rarities, right? And by disclosing this information to the public they then know what they are in for when they put their money in. Now, of course, there's the loopholes where game developers will require you to purchase an in-game currency, and that's a one-to-one. Uh, that's a one-to-one conversion, right? So, if I purchase premium currency in a game and then purchase those loot boxes with the premium currency, that is the workaround right now, because it's not it's not real money that you're spending on it; it's in-game money that you've paid oh, for. Oh, that's with, that's a sneaky little legal loophole right there. It is. So this this really so all that to say, this ties back to this dark UX, right? Sh- how do we regulate this to stop companies from taking advantage of the human psychology, right? We are very susceptible to some things when it comes to human psychology, uh like a Skinner box, for example, and that's exactly what loot boxes are. <laughs> so I, I, sometimes you get good items and sometimes you don't, but you pay money to do it. And when you do get a good item, it feels good. And so you keep pressing that Skinner box. And and I feel like hacking the psychology of humans to for monetary gain of the company 
Uh, obviously, it's wrong. But how can you do it in a way that, like, I don't, I don't know, man. This whole issue is tricky to me because companies want to make money. And if you make money by hacking the psychology of humans, I know this sounds bad, but you've effectively won the game by doing this. You are taking advantage of people and getting money, and that's capitalism. But it's also really messed up. And how do you, <laughs> like, where it's, it's tough to get to a middle ground, right? Like, people are getting taken advantage of and they don't feel good about it. But the well, company's the, here's money. the thing like, for me, too, Nick, is like, I don't know, this this high pressure tactics thing. I know it's probably been used for decades, if not longer, right, in just sales in general. But I think with the invention of the internet and these kind of services, when we're talking specifically about hotel booking sites, like they, it, it's almost like a very symbiotic r- relationship between those companies because they use each other as basically like, kind of like a, referencing like Kahneman and Tversky here, as anchor points for you to really feel like, Oh, I don't have much time. These other services won't give me the price that I want. All right. I'm just going to go ahead and pull a trigger. And I've been pressured into making a sale because I think that's the best thing. Um, but then we get into this really tricky loop where, okay, what if there's other fees that are in here that I'm not being told up front? So Nick, I think you're right. This is probably the trickiest situation that we're in right now. And I think it it definitely gets outside of the loop of this kind of hotel booking site deal for sure. But I feel like there's obvious ways to kind of be more upfront about what you're doing, like especially with these with these fees. I mean, I've been through a particular service that it wasn't until the very end of the actual transaction that I realized, oh my goodness, I am paying like a hundred dollars worth in fees, and I wouldn't have paid this if I had used a different service. So like being, I don't know being thoughtful enough to show those kind of things up front to people is just more of a kindness thing. But where do we really draw the line when it comes to business marketing, getting the sale done? And even like in a completely different realm, think about like just social media platforms like Facebook or Twitter. I mean, from notifications, it's hacking your biology, giving you that dopamine drip every time you see something new. Someone so liked my post. It, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's creating like an addictive behavior. So this just does it doesn't apply to one realm and it's hard to really draw that line between what's dark UX and like what's a nudge. Remember what we talked about last week, like what's a nudge and what's a manipulation. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then we, how do you enforce these rules? Two okay, a couple things. So first off, that whole nudge conversation, we had a really great discussion in the Slack about what counts as a nudge and what is the difference between a corporation nudge and a government nudge and if you want the if you want the bottom line to that go check out the slack uh is there a bottom line i don't know we'll see check the slack uh second off yeah you're right it's not just with these booking sites we're using this as an example but something like youtube plays more videos to keep you from leaving right as soon as one video is over it auto plays the next right and that's to keep you from leaving instagram trickles in your likes i don't know if you know this or not but if you get a bunch of likes on instagram it won't show you all those likes at the same time it will say you got one like and then an hour later you got another like and then it will slowly keep ramping up so that way you keep checking back for more right facebook uh wants you to show um Facebook wants to show you stuff. So it will forever scroll. If you keep going down, it will keep pulling up information further down. So that way it will always consistently be loading. Uh, Snapchat, that encourages users to keep up a streak or, you know, as the social pressure, right? Um, which I just started a Snapchat this week, which is, I'm, I'm, I don't like it. I'm, I'm like trying to play around with it. I don't like it. Uh <laughs> And, uh, you know, our media basically turns everything into breaking news because we want something fresh. We want something new. And the way these uh, booking sites are doing it, it's, it's saying something like, jackpot, you know, this is the best place. There, This is the best time to book this thing. And this all comes back to what is those high pressure tactics, right? We talk about these, uh, but that's a fairly ambiguous term. And it's just these kind of uh, you need to act now sort of um statements that encourage you to say, okay, well, I, I'm not going to get anything better. So I, I just take it now. Yeah, most definitely. I think the part of the part of the issue here is, I mean, if we come up with the rules for this, enforcing them is a whole nother beast, but I, you know, it's, I can't really make up my mind whether this is a good or a bad thing. I think, I think in some ways it is a good thing because it forces us 
in on so many levels to be smart consumers. And I'm not just talking about like when we're going for booking sites, like realizing like that Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat, they want you to keep coming back and they want you to spend a lot of time there. So realizing that can help you kind of get out of the trap of being in it. But one thing you brought up that is really important, I think, especially right now with the news is understanding that there's the same kind of idea going on there. Like everything's breaking news. You have to look now, you have to read this now. And there's like a constant flow of information that can almost lead to like a paralysis. So I feel like half of this battle is us as humans or us as people that are living in a new kind of world where information is all over the place and constantly coming in. We really have to just make up our minds that we're going to like take a second and think about these problems that we're facing. Um, and I feel, I feel like part of that is getting articles like this one for the next web that points out at the very end, like here's the things you should be paying attention to when you're buying stuff from one of these hotel sites or being aware enough to know like, Hey, Instagram is actually trickling in my likes. Why don't I just like bundle a bunch of time together where I look at all my social media and that's no more throughout the day. Um, I don't know. I think that's, that's the best way for us to combat this because with big businesses that run and are building apps and pouring money into research, they're gonna, they're gonna go to probably any means necessary to get you to convert and spend your money. And we just have to, be cognizant enough to outsmart that kind of tactic. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I, I agree 100%. I think we are faced with an interesting challenge with regulating this type of design. It's, yeah, I, I don't know. I can see where, you know, uh, if we do regulate it, we're going to have to, it, it's an interesting discussion to have because if we do regulate it, we're going to have to come down at some point as to, this is clearly wrong and manipulative, and this is the gray area where you're still okay to operate within, but you probably shouldn't. And then there's obviously the here's the best for the user. And it's like I, I almost don't – I don't know, man. It's it's such a tricky uh, line to navigate. Like you don't want to cross that line and piss people off. You don't want to cross that line and take advantage of people for monetary gain because – that's wrong. <laughs> and then you also don't want like, I don't know. There's, there's so, this is such an interesting topic. And I, and to be fair, this is in the UK, like the U S I think, and our sort of, uh, perception about capitalism, uh, hasn't forced the conversation on us quite yet, but I mean, it, it can't be far off. I don't think. No, I don't think so either. Uh, and I, one of the things that bothered me about this article, and it's it's really nothing against the next web or whoever put it together, is I want to understand this study that they followed all of this up with, because I want to know what was measured and all of that kind of good stuff, to really understanding some of their operational definitions for things like high pressure tactics and what they were looking at, um, because I, I think it is it will be valuable in the States, of course, because you, you know this kind of stuff is going on. I mean, there are stateside companies that do this hotel booking stuff. Um, and, and I wonder if from looking at data from studies like this, if you could do a comparison between like a company that, and I, you know, I don't even know this exists. This is complete like off the cuff type of stuff here. But if a company that goes has gone out of their way to design something that is like a a great product but is very upfront with they're the design patterns they use. Like if you will, they use like light pattern UX. They don't hide anything from you. It's a very upfront service. We're not trying to take your money. We have something we think is worth it. It's a good value proposition versus a, a company that's using maybe these darker tactics, right? And really compare the two if they're in the same market and see, okay, can companies be comparable if they're using contrasting patterns or does dark always win out or how can we make the lighter patterns win out? I think there's also a conversation to be had of how do you convince companies that you should have your customers um, best interest in mind throughout all aspects, not just what they have to do with their product, but how you're getting them to use your product. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Okay. So Blake, we got a little bit of time for, uh, community outreach. Do you want to get to uh, the next section here? Or do you have any other closing thoughts on that one? Let's go, man. I love talking to the people. 
Okay, so this is our It Came From Reddit section where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community's talking about. So any subreddit's fair game, as long as it relates to human factors and encourages discussion amongst the community. So, uh, Blake, since we have time for two, I'm thinking two and three. What are you thinking? I like it. I like it a lot. Okay. All right, so let's go with this one. Uh, so this is by, oh, I'm going to, me- oh, Absent Islands. Absent Islands writes, how to approach a company. I'm currently teaching myself UX design and have been making several wireframes for apps that I would like to improve usability for just as practice. One in particular is for my local bus ticket app, which currently is a nightmare to use. The app is run by my local public services. Hey, this sounds like a familiar story this week. Uh, I have no real work experience in UX and no official projects that I've worked on. I have the wireframe and proposal ready to go, but how do I actually propose it to public services? Would an email proposing my intention to help suffice? Should I expect pay for this type of thing? If so, uh, how would I phrase it slash say how much I would like to be paid? Any help is appreciated. Also, if this post isn't right, blah, blah, blah. Okay, thanks. And that, again, was by Absent Islands. Okay, Blake, so let's dig into this. So this was a really good choice because we are actually talking about public transportation and and the whole uh, reformation of of this. So I want to get your thoughts on this. Okay, um, trying to think how to how to go about this the best way, but this this is kind of my take on what you've got here, boss. Uh, so App Islands, this is some a great use case of kind of how you can dive into UX, especially if you see a problem that's out there that you don't know that it isn't being solved by anybody. And as you mentioned, you don't really have any true experience, so this is a good way to build your portfolio piece. Um, so. You're talking about local public services, and this was brought up a lot at Design Forward over the past few or last week. Was how do okay? We've got these great ideas, um, but how do we get them implemented? And since you're talking about local public services, that honestly means going to those community meetings that let you get your ideas heard, um, which may mean that you don't really get too far the first time you go. I mean, you're going to have to figure out. Who is responsible for this public service that I'm trying to fix? Who's really impacted by it? And then how do I get in touch with these people? Because you can send emails to public officials, but I guarantee you they are getting bombarded by emails, phone calls. They have maybe one or two secretaries. So you're just going to have to keep running it, uh, trying to get your stuff seen. Um, My only question is, or my biggest comment is, you say you've got wireframes and a proposal ready to go, which is awesome. But you need to make sure that you've done some research behind all of this. Like, what made you develop these wireframes? Who is this going to benefit? How do you know it's going to benefit this particular population of people? And uh, the last thing I've kind of got is I don't know that you should expect to be paid here because yeah. this is like trying to help as a public service. If you like want a contract for this, awesome. That's great. But I guarantee you there's a lot of teams that are working on this kind of stuff. And as my last point, if you figure out like who who you need to talk to, also are people trying to tackle this problem? One thing you might be able to do is show this to current companies like, I don't know, design firms in your city or UX firms in your city, human factors firms in your city that are trying to tackle this problem. If you find that out and show your work and ideas, that actually might get you a job. Yeah. So uh, the only other thing I'd add to that is, I mean, yes, this shouldn't. I don't think you should ask for money for this type of thing. Like like Blake said, it is a public service. And honestly, if you're teaching yourself UX, chances are you don't have a whole lot of experience under your belt. Now, that being said, if you do sort of bubble this idea around and it does get adopted, that is absolutely something you can put on your resume. And I would encourage you to put this in your portfolio anyway. Um, but just to show that you've thought out this problem, it may not be implemented. I would at least go as far as presenting it at a town hall meeting or something to that extent, if you reach out and talk to the right people. Uh, Cause that way you can say, look, I actually proposed this idea and we got buy-in from this many people, but it didn't go together. It didn't come together for whatever reason. You at least say that you you've done this thing. And uh, I, yeah, I, I think the best advice for you is to just keep trying. And um, potentially if you are looking for a, uh, a way to exercise your skills and try to find a way into UX um, by teaching yourself. I would say the small businesses are a great place to start. 
Um, especially if you can talk with them and say, Hey, look, uh, I noticed your website isn't all that great. Uh, and, or, well, I mean, don't, don't approach it that way, but I mean, look for websites that aren't all that great and say, Hey, look, I'm, uh, looking to do UX design and, and, uh, I would like to tackle your website for free. And all I ask is that you allow me to put my name on your website that says I helped design this and I'll work with your, a couple of your customers to try to figure this out. And, and then from there, uh, you can actually put that project on your portfolio and talk about the process of meeting with the people who, whose company you're representing. And, and I, I feel like that's a little bit of a better in rather than going through a government approach, because there are so many hoops and hurdles that you have to jump through and over to get to a point where a policy or, um, some sort of uh, project is implemented in the long term. I 100% agree, Nick. And I like your uh, extra point of how you can actually jump into UX from a small business perspective. This, this like tackling a government agency problem or a local services problem is a really big thing to try and push for your first UX project. And I definitely applaud you for trying it out. And But I would definitely follow Nick's advice like try a little bit smaller to keep getting you those portfolio pieces and again like look and see if there's other companies in your area that are trying to tackle this problem see if you can add to their their work yep yep uh okay uh any other thoughts on that one before we get into the next one let's Last see what's one. up next man okay so this one is ux designers what is your opinion on repeat interviewees for testing and this is from reddit blow five uh, what is your opinion on recycling a user to interview, uh, i.e. testing a user for concept testing and prototype testing? All right, Nick, I want you to take this one first because I have some <laughs> kind of mind-breaking stuff that I experienced at the conference last week about this. So Ooh. let's see what you got. Oh, I'm so curious, though, Blake. Now I feel like whatever I say is just going to be completely stupid compared to what you have to say. But all right. Oh, no, no, not at all. I will take a stab at it. I think... Uh, recycling users is fine if it's in the right context. I think if you're trying to evaluate some new piece of technology, I think it's fine to introduce the same users as long as they know what you're going after, right? If you're doing something as clinically as you can where you're trying to get a complete sample size, um, then no, but usability testing isn't clean. And I think that you are honestly scraping for whatever you can get sometimes. And if you need an, a user that you've used before, that's fine. Um, I think it's just when you're testing the same thing, you can't say like, look, here's this thing I showed you five months ago. What do you think now? Uh, well, it's the same thing. So what are you evaluating? But I know I work with a lot of users who uh, are repeat users and it's fine to visit them later when we have a new iteration of something and say, Hey, look, we took your feedback in, uh, and we changed it according to your, uh, sort of specifications and requirements and needs. Now with this in mind, what do you think of this new one? And if you, especially if you develop a rapport with them, they're more likely to share with you some, uh, insights that, you know, if it was their first time out, they may be a little shy or timid to, um, to report, even if you do say, you know, I'm your advocate and, and I'm trying to do what's in your best interest here. And just by taking your feedback. So I think it's good. I think it's fine. As long as you're not showing them the same exact thing and you explain to them what the differences are and, uh, how to go, how to go from there. But Blake, I want to hear this mind blowing thing. Yeah. Okay. So one of the speakers at, um, at Design Forward was actually Phil Gilbert. He's one of the major pe players at IBM and has really, worked on getting design integrated into all aspects of IBM. And something that they actually do for testing is they, because they're dealing with products that are IP are not being released yet, but they really want that user input, they have sponsored specific users that they constantly bring in as iterations change of their product. So these people like are, are their basically dedicated user for this product set and they keep coming in and out and in and out as the product grows before launch or beta or any of that kind of stuff. So I just thought that was a, an awesome practice that I hadn't really heard of. But at the same time, it blew my mind that there's a big company out there that is obviously seen so much benefit from implementing design and really understanding their users up front and how it's changed the faces of their products that they've actually developed a program that's bringing people in to come and be their dedicated users for a product, depending on the life cycle. Um, Nick, I agree with you. 
wholeheartedly. I think a lot of the times what we're dealing with, we're in like, or I don't know, especially a recent for me doing freelance stuff, you're in rough, rough and tumble situations. You just need to get people to do usability tests so you know what these cha- what changes that you're making, if they're having any positive effect, negative effect, or nothing at all. So sometimes you do have to run, you know, repeat people. I'd say if you didn't have to, if you had a big enough population of users you could pull from, awesome. Just you don't have to do any repeats. But if you're going to repeat people, like Nick said, make sure that it's showing increments over time of what's changing in your product, your interface, whatever it is, your service. Um, the only thing that I, I guess, like the really only closing thought I have for that is it's you have to be careful, I guess, with the learning effects of using a product over and over and some sometimes you'll you can see that and it may seem like if i only use the five core users that i have access to all the time over a long period of time they may have just become you know acclimated to the piece of software that i've been building and the choices i've been making so they they might be giving you skewed results if you're just running them over and over because they've now gotten used to the product versus like somebody brand new you may put them in front of it the first time to use your your prototype app, and they have no idea what to do. Whereas your five users that you ran through, ran tests through multiple times, they really understand the workflow. So it's just, it kind of, I think it definitely depends on the product, access to people, time frame, lots of different things. Yep, I, I completely agree. All right, let's hit that thing and get out of here. That's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you think of our stories this week. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Let us know. If you guys have any suggestions for topics or news stories you want us to cover, you can head on over to our Slack or follow us on social media. Uh, we're on Human Factors Cat LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. And like I said, our Slack, our link can be found in the show notes on our SoundCloud or our website. Uh, and uh, you can always uh, send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Even better than an email, give us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you like what we're doing want to support us financially, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us. We haven't gotten one of those in a while. Uh, but please do that on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Armstrong, thank you for hanging out with me and breaking down all the stories about sports this week. Where can our listeners find you? Oh, Dick, there's nothing I love more than breaking down sports every week with you. Guys, you can find me on Twitter, as always, at Don't Panic UX. And be on the lookout for, in our Slack this week, a brand new question to try and engage the community a little bit more. Maybe you'll learn a little bit from me and Nick. Maybe you'll learn something from your other friends in the Slack. Excellent. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. I just realized, Blake, I didn't do the outro in my Dracula voice. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors, guys. Until next time, have a spooky Halloween. It depends. <laughs> it depends. It depends.